Hello and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rice, and on each episode, I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And on this episode, we are heading back into the dark and mysterious world of death omens. Yes, death omens, which, as the name suggests, are ghostly omens of death. And we'll be exploring some extremely creepy first-hand accounts from people who encountered these death omens in person, who saw them with their own eyes. And if that wasn't enough, at the end of this episode, I will also be giving you a quick update on all the exciting, weird and wonderful projects and plans that I've got going on at the moment. There will be some good news, there will be some bad news, and best of all, there will be some Halloween news. So if you do want to catch all of that, keep listening right until the very end of this episode. But first, the death omens. And so, to begin, at the beginning... And if you listened to the last episode, and you don't have to have listened to the last episode to enjoy this one, but if you did listen to it, this is, in effect, part two of our exploration into a very specific kind of death omen, what I described as the most common variety of death omen, but that doesn't make it any less terrifying. And that is the corpse candle, or canoeth corf as it's known in the Welsh language. Corpse candles, which are floating orbs that appear before a death and serve as a warning that somebody in the local area will soon be saying goodbye to this world and hello to the next. And we are going to dive straight in with an account of a corpse candle that was experienced by a man called Owen Evans from Meister Therwen near Llansawel in Carmarthenshire, who was in his 90s when he recalled these events, which he recalled in the early 1900s, and he says they took place when he was a boy. So we're looking at the first half of the 19th century, and at the time of this experience, he was in the neighbouring county of Ceredigion, or Cardiganshire, as it was at the time, and he was in the village of Cillian near Lampeter, where his father lived in an old house close to the churchyard walls. And as such, or maybe that's why he was there, but as such, he kept the key of the church door. So anyone who wanted to enter the church needed to see Owen's father beforehand to get the keys or simply to let him know what was going on so he could open the door and then lock it afterwards. And we are told that, to quote, singing practice was often conducted in the church, especially during the long winter evenings. And as regular listeners will know, long winter evenings are a great time for ghost stories. And one evening, a certain young man entered the churchyard with the intention of going to the church to attend the singing class. However, it was a little too soon. So this young man, this keen young man, had arrived at the church early. He was tiptoeing through the graves towards the church. Well, maybe not tiptoeing, but certainly walking through the churchyard towards the church. It was early. He expected to be alone, but he could see light in the church through one of the windows. So he went to the church door thinking that the singing had commenced, or at least that someone was in the church preparing it. But to his great surprise, he found the door closed and locked. And when he looked in through the keyhole, there was not a soul to be seen inside the church. So the young man could see a light was on in the church. And of course, this is back in the days before electricity in churches, when people would have to make a special effort to turn a light on. You wouldn't just accidentally flip a light switch. But whatever was causing this light, he was unable to enter. And he had to go and see somebody who might have access to the church to work out what the heck was going on. And if you've been paying close attention, you will know 
that the man with the keys is Owen Evans's father. And that's exactly who he went to see. That's exactly what he did. He went to the house of Owen Evans's father and informed the old man that there was a light in the church, but that he did not see anyone inside. And after listening to all of this, in reply, Owen's father said, You must be making a mistake. There cannot possibly be any light in the church. No one could have entered the building to light it, for the door is locked and I have the key here in the house. Now, this boy was not in the mood to be called a liar. He was a good honest Welsh Christian boy who'd gone to church early for singing practice. He must have been a good, honest person. And he insisted he was adamant. And I don't mean he had a a white stripe on his face, but he was adamant that he was telling the truth. And he insisted, I am positively certain that there is light in the church, for I took particular notice of it. So I am sure you can see where this conversation is going. They both disagreed. They were both adamant that they were correct. And there was only one way to sort it out. Both of the two men now went to the church together. And as they approached, they noticed a light coming out from the church. So it appeared that the boy was correct. There was, or indeed there had been, a light in the church because it was a light that was moving, which suggests it was being carried by somebody. But as they approached the church, the light approached them. It departed from the church and was itself winding its way through the graves, tiptoeing through the graveyard towards them. And we are told that this light moved slowly, but not directly towards them. It veered instead to a certain point in the churchyard. So it did not go directly for the men. It veered off to a certain point and the two men followed it and watched it until it suddenly disappeared down into the holy ground. And the folklorist tells us that they both knew immediately that it was a corpse candle. It was a corpse candle. They had no doubt in their minds. They might have disagreed earlier, but now the two men, the young man and Owen's father, both agreed this was a corpse candle. And the younger man had a walking stick in his hand with which he made a mark or a hole in the ground on the spot where the light had sunk, almost like X marks the spot. He used the stick to mark the spot. And soon after this, sure enough, a death took place in the neighborhood. And the dead was buried, again, I am sure you were one step ahead of me here, was buried in the very spot where the corpse candle had sunk into the ground. And this ghostly apparition certainly ticks all the boxes of what we believe a corpse candle to be. An eerie light that leads towards the final resting place of somebody who will not be with us, or at least not in the flesh and blood sense. They might be with us spiritually, but who will not be with us much longer. It is a macabre prediction of the future. And while that corpse candle was witnessed by Owen's father and the young man. Owen himself also saw a corpse candle in his lifetime in the same neighbourhood. And while there's very few details of what happened on that occasion, well, very few, while there's no details, there's no details whatsoever of what happened, we do know who it related to, because he saw this corpse candle before the death of an adopted son of one Mr. John Evans, who lived nearby. Now, most of these accounts of corpse candles on on this episode, on the previous episode, on all the other episodes I've done about corpse candles come to us from the 19th century, because simply that's when folklorists started gathering and publishing such accounts. But that's not to say there weren't corpse candles before or afterwards. And the grandfather of Welsh folklore, the tarred key of Welsh folklore, or Welsh ghost lore, more specifically, Wales's original ghost hunter, the Reverend Edmund 
Jones did also record similar accounts in the previous century. And one such account dates from the century before that again. So this next account comes to us from the 17th century. Evidence that corpse candles have been forewarn in the good people of Wales of upcoming deaths for centuries and centuries. And the Reverend tells us of how a young woman living in Montgomeryshire, one of Wales's historic counties, so she was from the top half of Powys today, although it's not really important where she's from, because the encounter with the corpse candle takes place elsewhere in Wales. Because she had travelled westward to visit friends in the Ceredigion village of Llan Illa, which isn't too far away from our last account. It's about a half an hour drive or so from Lampeter. And sadly, it proved to be quite an ill-fated visit to go and see these friends. In fact, it proved to be a fatal visit. It was a visit she did not return from. Because, according to local tradition, she drowned attempting to cross the river Astwith during a flood. And the good reverend who recorded this account tells us that a short time before the melancholy event took place, people in the neighbourhood had seen a corpse candle hovering up and down the river. So the locals knew in advance that somebody was going to die in the river, and in hindsight, Maybe they should have warned people. Maybe they should have warned this newcomer beforehand. But there is, at the same time, a sense of inevitability about these corpse candles. If you see them, you cannot change the future. There are no accounts of people defying the corpse candles. If you see them, the event will come to pass. And as I've mentioned on previous episodes, bodies of water were popular places to see corpse candles. And the cynical might suggest that's because they might be caused by natural causes that are more likely to be seen in these wet and windy marsh places. But the true believers will tell you that it's simply because bodies of water were far more dangerous back in the day, especially at night time and especially during a flood. And one particular tradition from nearby Carmarthenshire speaks of a three-flamed corpse candle on the water. And corpse candles do come in many shapes and sizes and the colours of which might offer a clue as to who is going to die. But in Carmarthenshire, this three-flamed corpse candle, which was seen on the surface of the water near Golden Grove, a short time before three persons were drowned near the spot... And again, you don't need me to point out how a three-flamed corpse candle could signify three tragic victims. Now, staying in Carmarthenshire for one more strange encounter, and our next witness is, or was by now, an old man named James, who lived in the village of Nantgeredig, and unlike our earlier account where a son and a father both saw corpse candles but on separate occasions, in this case they saw them together, the son and the father, plus many more people besides. This corpse candle was not shy. Everyone saw it doing its thing, and it was doing it in the parish of Cunoil Elved. And to quote, When James was a boy, he was sent one day by a farmer's wife on a message to the wonderfully named Llan Pimpsaint, about three miles off, to fetch a pair of clogs from the blacksmith and a few small things from a shop in the village. So, This is back in the good old days when farmers' wives could just summon young boys and send them off to do jobs for them. But of course, these chores were much more time-consuming back then. There were no 24-hour shops or convenience stores on every corner. If you wanted something, you really had to go out of your way to get it. And in some cases, you had to go to the next town or village. And that's exactly what James had to do. And so he set off the Llan Pimpsaint, where he went first to the blacksmith, but he had to wait there as the clogs were not ready, so he was already behind schedule just after his first stop. Then he went to the village shop, but by the time he went there, unfortunately, the woman who kept the shop was not at home, and he had to wait several hours again for the shopkeeper to come back. 
so that when he finally returned to the farm with the message in reply for the farmer's wife, plus the clogs, plus whatever groceries or whatever it was he was buying in the shop, it was quite dark. But on the plus side, she made it worth his while by giving him plenty to eat and a present of a waistcoat. What more could a young man want than plenty to eat and a present of a waistcoat? Which might seem like a strange present to give to a young man, but hey, simpler times. Maybe that's where we're going wrong nowadays. If you have a troublesome youngster, a troublesome teenager, all they need is a nice waistcoat. But now James, with a full belly and a fancy new waistcoat, made his way home back to Nantglass, where his parents lived. But it was now getting later in the evening. It was getting darker. And he was only a young boy on his own going along a lonely road. And I hope you can picture the scene here. Maybe the owls are hooting. Maybe the bats are flapping. And James is making his way steadily through rural Wales at dusk. And it's getting darker and darker. And as he neared Cum Guerin on the route, he noticed some light coming after him. Just over his shoulder, he could pick out some, some blurry form in the background, but just like the night that was getting darker and darker, this apparition was getting closer and closer. And before he knew it, it was no longer behind him, it had reached him. Yes, that glowing ghostly form had caught up with him. And if you were expecting some terrifying ghostly encounter, I might have to disappoint you, for now at least, anyway. Because what happened next was, after pausing for dramatic effect, nothing. Absolutely nothing. The light reached him. There was no interaction. There was no scares. Nothing. It simply continued on its journey. And that's one of the good things about corpse candles is that because as terrifying as they might sound, they are simply omens. They are not an immediate threat, at least not necessarily. Usually they're not a threat. They simply need to play out what they need to play out. And in this case, this corpse candle, if we assume it is a corpse candle, had some predetermined route it had to follow regardless of anyone else who might be around. And while it might have scared this, well, it definitely scared this boy, as we'll find out, but that was not its intention. Its intention was purely to go about doing omen type things. The getting scared part is simply an unfortunate side effect, but this light went straight past the boy it simply kept hovering and to quote it was about two feet from the ground as it went slowly along so off it floated slowly about two feet off the ground now with this light ahead of him on the road james did quite a sensible thing which people don't usually do in ghost stories he decided to show some other people he decided to knock the door of a house he was passing and called the attention of the inmates to the strange light on the road so now we have several witnesses to this strange event and after they'd all seen it disappear into the distance james decided to continue on his route home but you just can't rely on these corpse candles to do the right thing and can you believe it after carrying on on his journey, James ended up catching up with the candle once more. It was going so slowly, he overtook the death omen. He plucked up all his courage to do so, but nevertheless, he then walked past the death omen. And to put this into a little bit of context, just in case you're wondering, what the heck is this pesky corpse candle playing at? Why is it just going in a straight line at different speeds, slow and fast and slow and fast? What's going on? Well, it was believed that corpse candles, or certainly some corpse candles, followed the route that a real-life funeral would take soon after. And so the speed and the direction of a corpse candle was dictated by the future funeral. So, for example, if it was a casket being carried by horses, it might be zipping down the road a bit quicker than if it was being carried by, say, human hands. 
and if the funeral procession had to stop or change direction for any reason, that would then affect the corpse scandal. So let's just say the horses are going down the road at a speed and a squirrel runs out in front of them and scares them. Well, that might slow them down. That might make the candle pause for a moment. But after the horses have gathered themselves together, they might then progress at a fast speed again. Or maybe those poor pallbearers lugging that big casket down the road have to stop for a breather Again, the candle is going to slow down, maybe come to a stop, and then resume its journey. And as such, or, well, maybe, maybe not as such, we don't know for certain, but for the sake of this story, as such, that might explain why James caught up with the corpse candle in the way he did. And not only did he catch up with it, he overtook it and carried on on his way. And when he arrived home, he told his parents of it, and his father unsurprisingly, would not believe he had seen a light. He did not believe James when he told him of this corpse candle. But the boy opened the front door of the house just as the light was passing. This corpse candle went straight past their house and he called his father to come out and see it. And he didn't come alone. The whole family came out and both his father and the other children saw the light. But... Interestingly here, his mother and one of the children did not see it. And we are told that the reason this family gathered outside their house looking at the corpse candle, but two of them could not see it, is because they did not possess second sight. They did not have the necessary powers. Although second sight, while you might think of it as something given to gifted people, in this sense, it sounds like the opposite. It sounds like most people in this family, at least, and the household he called on before arriving home have got it. You're the strange one if you haven't got second sight. But anyway, soon after this, a child died at a nearby house and James's father and his neighbours were convinced that the light which they had seen was that poor soul's corpse candle. And on that tragic note, we've reached the end of this account of corpse candles. We've reached the end of our last account of corpse candles on this episode. In fact, we've reached the end of the normal part of this episode. Although I don't think normal is the correct word in this context. There's nothing normal about this podcast. So ends, so ends the abnormal part of the podcast. And if you tuned in just to hear the Death Omen stories, then this is where the journey ends for you on this episode. But if you did want to listen to me talk rubbish for a little bit longer, I did promise one of my updates with some good news, some bad news, and best of all, some Halloween news. And we'll dive straight into that right now. And if you are new to the podcast, maybe this is your first episode, in which case, welcome to the podcast. But besides this podcast, I also do many, many other weird and wonderful things. I've published several books about Welsh ghosts and folklore and other things besides Welsh culture and history and so on and so on. I do talks, I do events, and I have lots of other exciting projects up my sleeve. And twice, maybe three times a year, I like to do these updates just to bring everyone up to speed with what's going on. And it also gives me a chance to shamelessly promote my new books. But I promise I won't do too much of that right now. Now, let's start with the good news. And actually, no, let's let's start with the bad news because nobody wants to hear me go off on a downer. So let's get the bad news out of the way. And it it, it is very bad news. Oh, it, it's, it's very sad news, I should say, rather than bad. It's bad and it's sad. Um, and it's something I... Um, I, I I didn't I didn't want to talk about on the podcast. I actually I, I thought long and hard about this a few months ago, and I decided not. I, de- I decided I I I wouldn't mention it. But um, when it came to doing this update, I realised I had to mention it in some way because it does um, relate to what I spoke about on on my last update. But um, anyway, anyway, I'm I'm going to mention this quickly. I'm not going to dwell on it, and you, you'll appreciate why very soon. But on my last update, I did speak about some exciting things that I had coming up. And the one that I was most excited about was the video content. And I hate the word content, but for want of a better word, content, the video content that I was working on. Now, I was working on this with a very, uh, a very dear friend of mine, um, 
a very, very talented filmmaker. And that episode went out sort of late, late February, early March time um, on a Thursday, like it always does. My, my episodes always go out on a Thursday. And a few days after that episode was was published, um, th- th- there's th- there's no sort of easy easy way of saying. There's no sort of simple way of saying it. But my my friend who I was working with passed away very suddenly, and as I'm sure you can appreciate, that's not the kind of thing I want to go into in much detail uh, right here right now. And also, it's not the kind of thing that should be tucked away at the end of an episode. And I really am trying to think of a of a good way to do something in their in their memory and as soon as i do you'll be the first people to find out what what that is i'm sure that will be a much more positive update when it comes and while i am not going to to get into the personal side of things i think any, anyone who has experienced this or e- even if you haven't i'm sure you can appreciate um the the situation but what what i did want to mention because it it is a a, a bit weird. Well it's, it's well it's not weird. Um, maybe it's quite normal. But when you when when you sort of waste as much time as I do writing and and talking and and going on social media and recording podcasts and writing books about ghosts and and death and funerals and graveyards and and, and corp scandals of course and death omens and all this stuff. When when that impacts you in in the real world you do or le- well, I, I i can't speak for anyone else i i personally quickly lost interest in in anything to do with those kind of topics that that's not the kind of stuff i want going on um in my spare time as it were when you're dealing with darkness and and, and sadness in the real world you know the, the last thing i wanted was to go home and and read books and watch films about this stuff n- n- not just because of this there's there's other, other things going on but as a result this the spring and and the summer i did have a bit of um a bit of an existential crisis i guess you could say and i spent a lot more time on the what i guess what you could call the non spooky stuff that i also uh, spend a lot of time writing and researching and things, the art history, the opera, the theatre, the Shakespeare and things. But the good news is, because that is the bad news out of the way, we, we are coming to the good news now. And the good news is spooky season is looming and I have had my first sip of pumpkin spice latte. And if there is one thing in the world guaranteed to perk me up again, it is pumpkin spice latte. Maybe with some candy corn thrown in as well. Although, as I've discovered from many of my North American listeners, people think I am mad for importing candy corn to Britain. People in America are throwing this stuff away, and I'm over here paying extortionate prices to get the stuff imported. But if you don't want your candy corn, send it to Wales. But anyway, I've got my mojo back as it were and the leaves are falling and it's 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 the best time of year as, as i'm recording this it's the end of september october is just uh peering over the mountains uh, over the vast welsh mountains at me as as i record in this and i know that within days within days i will be fully immersed in autumn's goodness i will be back in october country to um to to accidentally quote the title of a Ray Bradbury book there. But there's nothing wrong with that because everyone loves Ray Bradbury at this time of year. And if you haven't read October Country, stop listening to me and go and read October Country. But the good news, and actually before I do the good news, there is one thing I would like to say. And I, I've, I've said this before, but I, I don't say this often enough. But I mentioned over the summer and in, in the spring, I did lose uh, a bit of my uh, passion, I guess you could say, uh, for the the, the the spookier stuff that I do. But but there is one thing I didn't lose my passion for, and that was this podcast. So while I didn't do any talks and, and I took a step back from, from the books and, and watching the films and videos and all the rest of it, this podcast kept going bang on schedule every single episode. And the reason I did that is purely because, and this is 100% genuine, I honestly can't believe how many people are listening to this podcast around the world every single episode. And in a way, it makes me feel obliged that I have to do it. And so it is thanks to you, and it's also your fault, but it's thanks to you that I keep doing this every single episode. And I've said it before, I'll say it again, it blows my brain that when you think about it, it's such a ridiculously niche, a ridiculously 
specific subject to be recording a podcast about. It's the kind of thing, I mean, Ghosts and Folklore of Wales, it's about as niche a subject as a podcast about Japanese breakfast cereals or something. It is so, it is so obscure. Who the heck wants to listen to that? Well, clearly there are thousands and thousands of people around the world, which is just amazing. I don't know why, but what I can say is I really, really appreciate it. And long may it continue. If if you keep listening to this nonsense, I'll keep recording this nonsense no matter what happens. Now, Good news. Let's do the good news. And I guess the big good news, if you enjoy my books, if you don't enjoy my books, you could put this into the bad news section. But the good news is that if you enjoy my books, I mentioned on the last update, I had two new Welsh ghost books coming up. They are both finished. They are both heading your way. The first one will be out in November. And if you follow me on social media, you will already know this. And if you don't follow me on social media, please follow me on social media. But the book in November is going to be called Paranormal Cardiff. Paranormal Cardiff. And if you did read Paranormal Wales, and I know some of you must have, otherwise they wouldn't have commissioned another one. But if you read Paranormal Wales, you'll know the kind of thing to expect. Lots of ghost stories, lots of folklore. And what I really wanted to emphasise with this book and the other books is almost to tell a history of the city in ghost stories. And at the same time, and this is an important thing with all of my books, or, or all of my books in the Paranormal series, I should say, not, not all of the books, but with the books in the Paranormal series, I want the reader to be able, where possible, to go and visit these locations after reading about them. I don't want to talk about some story that happened in some house at some point in the past, a long time ago. Instead, wherever possible, it's not always possible, but wherever possible, I want to show photographs of these places, you are effectively using words and photos to point a finger at these places and say, look, there it is. And as a result, if you read it and you so desire to go there and look for ghosts yourself and go and visit the place, hopefully it makes it a little bit easier and gives you a bit more enthusiasm to jump in your car or jump in your plane, wherever you might be in the world, and go and visit these places if that's how you enjoy spending your weekends. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I will be talking about that in much more detail in November on this podcast. And moving on to the second new ghost book I've got coming out, which I can't say much about at the moment, besides the fact that it's being published in August 2024. And if that wasn't enough, if you weren't sick of them yet, I am very pleased to announce that I have signed the contract, or rather contracts, for two more books. So that means there are at least four more books on the way from me. And it works out quite nicely. It's one a year. So there's one in November. There's one next August. Then there'll be one in 2025 and another one in 2026. And who knows if people keep buying them, maybe there'll be one in 2027 and beyond. And I did mention there'd be a shameless plug coming up. And the shameless plug is that Paranormal Cardiff is available to pre-order right now. As always, it's best to get it from your local bookshop if they can order it for you. But if not, there is a link on my website that will take you to one of those big online retailers that can get you the book wherever you are in the world. So there's no excuse not to get a copy for your entire family for Christmas. Or, well, not, not one copy for your entire family. Get them one each. Get them one each for Christmas. I am sure they will thank you. Now, on to the Halloween update, which is also part of the good news update. And as regular listeners will know again, I like to dedicate all of October to Halloween episodes, or Norse Kalangayev, as we call it in Wales. And this year, that means there'll be two Halloween episodes. Some years, there's three. It depends how the calendar falls. But this year, there's going to be two. And on the next episode... I'm going to be joined by a special guest, a very good friend of mine, to look at Halloween folklore in Wales, but also further afield. I haven't recorded the episode yet, but I've got a funny feeling Canada might play a part in the next episode to give you a little teaser, a little something for my Canadian friends who tune in. But we're going to look at Halloween in different countries, different ages, different 
generations. And if you're wondering what all of that means, well, you'll just have to listen to the next episode. How is that as a great way of getting people to hit the subscribe button? If you want to know more about that Halloween folklore, tune in to the next episode. But even better, the episode after that one is this year's big Halloween special, and that will be published just days before Halloween itself, on the Thursday before Halloween. And yes, I can confirm that it will be a ghost hunt episode. We are going out and about for that one, and I have assembled a team of Wales' greatest ghost hunters for the challenge. And we are going to a location which I'm quite excited about, because this location has many documented cases of paranormal activity that span certainly a century, maybe even centuries, I will find out for certain before I record that episode, but at least a hundred years worth of hauntings. But despite this, and this is why I'm so excited about going to this place, despite this, it has, up until now, gone under the radar. And to the best of my knowledge, nobody has ever filmed or recorded there before. It certainly hasn't been on any of the big TV shows or anything like that. And having spoken to the owner, who is friendly with the previous owner, as far as they know, there has only ever been one paranormal investigation conducted there. And this was many. This was at least five years ago, if not earlier. And again, to the best of my knowledge, nothing that they discovered has been put into the public domain. Although they did discover several things that we will discuss on that episode, which is going to be, I don't use this word very often, but which is going to be an exclusive for this podcast. You heard it here first. We are going ghost hunting in an exclusive location for Halloween this year. And finally, if all of that wasn't enough, one final piece of Halloween news, and it's also one final piece of good news, and it concerns video content. I still hate the word content, but this is good news about video content. And I can confirm that One of the fearless ghost hunters who will be joining me on this Halloween investigation is also a filmmaker. A filmmaker who will be there with their filming equipment. And that means I'm not entirely sure what their plans are yet, but that does mean for the first time ever, not only can you just listen to these episodes, there will also be video footage available from the same location. I don't know if that's a trick or a treat. That's up to you to decide. But I will tell you all about that on the Halloween episode. All of which, finally, 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 it feels like I've been talking for hours, but all of which, finally, brings me to the end of my update and does bring me to the end of another episode of the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. If you are still listening, I take my hat off to you. I applaud you. You are one of the hardcore listeners who keeps going right until the end. And I really do appreciate it. And I don't take anything for granted. And I hope you enjoy what's coming up for Halloween. If you really enjoyed it, as always, please consider pressing the subscribe button. Then you will not miss an episode. You will not miss those Halloween episodes. And if you really, really enjoyed it, You can support the podcast by treating me to a coffee via my website, or you can just leave a nice review or rating or something. If you'd like more Ghosts and Folklore, I've already mentioned this a few times, but you can follow me on social media. I'm on all the main platforms, and I've also written a number of weird and wonderful books, including Paranormal Cardiff, which will be on sale in November. And on that note, it just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian Amrando. I've been Mark Rice. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast, beaming to you from Wales to the world. And while we might indeed spend a lot of time talking about death and ghosts and graveyards and the rest of it on this podcast, as the late, great Terry Pratchett showed in so many of his works, These subjects can also bring joy. They can even bring laughter. And to quote one of the great writers, many great characters, no one is actually dead until the ripples they cause in the world die away. Until next time, no stuff.